This is episode 76 with Kate Dodgson. Welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, the show that empowers you to become the hero of your life's journey. With your host, Brian Tier. You just have to make a move. What is up, everyone? This is Brian Tier, your host, as always, of the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast. Episode 76 this week, and those were the wise words of this week's guest, Kate Dodgson. Now, before I get on to Kate, just a couple of announcements. The first is a big shout out to our sponsor. Again, it's Rooster. Rooster is the awesome new alarm clock app that allows you to wake up to voice notes from friends or family, or even channels you choose, such as inspiring messages, sports news, uh, news headlines, and much, much more, including a channel by yours truly. Then on a personal front, I'm very proud to announce that I became became a married man last week. Uh, my now wife and I decided to tie the knot in a very simple um, ceremony with our parents and her son, who's now my stepson. Super stoked about that. So I am a married man and couldn't be happier um, with how things have gone and all the support from everybody. So if you are listening to this and you've sent a message, thank you so much. And uh, I think it's time we get on to this week's episode. So Kate Dodgson is the author of the new book, Not My Jam, which is a project she started after experiencing her own quarter-life comeback. She spent most of her 20s experimenting with different lifestyles and careers and worked as a lawyer, writer, project manager, and a consultant, but unfortunately spent an equal amount of time unemployed, panicking, and moping around the house, desperately trying to figure out her life. Kate thought she had her shit together after qualifying as a lawyer at 23 and then landing her dream job at the United Nations. She was paid well, had a killer job description, and was living overseas, but something wasn't quite right. After moving jobs and experiencing the same thing elsewhere, Kate wanted to know why this was happening to her and how she could deal with it, and so she reached out to others to share their stories and advice. She started speaking to friends and then friends of friends and then anybody who couldn't get away from her at parties. As a result, she ended up with over 100 hours of recorded interviews and then combined them with research on psychology, sociology, Generation Y and 20-somethings to create her book as a resource for others in the same situation. Now, in this episode, you're going to learn how a dream job can still lead to a lack of fulfillment. Should you quit your job to take a working sabbatical? How to avoid getting sucked into vacation jobs? Should you quit your job or start a side project first? Why our generation is different from those before us? And the importance of having someone that asks you the right questions. As always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in this episode at bryantier.com slash 076. But for now, let's go hang out with Kate. Welcome back, everyone, and a big welcome to today's guest. I'm excited to be speaking to Kate Dodge, and Kate, welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to be speaking. Um, we connected, I think, after I interviewed Matt Trinetti way back in like episode 21 or something. Um, and I think, like I said, you're the second Australian guest I've had on. But what's pretty cool is that you wrote most of your book in South Africa. Um, That's so right. there's a, a common link there, which I'm sure we'll get into. But for people who, you know, aren't familiar with you and and the book, why don't you tell us a bit about your quarter life story? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I used to work as a lawyer. I spent six years at law school and then practiced law for two years, and then had the crippling realization that I wasn't happy in it. Um, I did a lot of research, did a lot of reading, and just one day decided. I had to quit because I didn't I didn't know what I wanted to do next. So I thought rather than just hanging in there and trying to figure it out, I just have to quit outright, get myself in a better headspace, and then take it from there. Um, I thought, what's the best way of figuring out what to do next and how to cope with this? And I thought, talk to other people, ask them how they got through it. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, I might as well start documenting it and sort of compiling it so that anyone else who's going through the same difficulties I'm going through can learn from all the people I'm learning from. So I kind of decided, uh, yeah, I put a book together of other people's stories, he, uh, hearing and discussing, talking about how they coped with their quarter-life crisis. And then I would add my own sort of research in as well. 
Yeah, I love it. And it's it's kind of the same reason I started this podcast was like I I wanted to ask people these questions and share them with people listening so that they could kind of benefit from those answers at the same time. Um, and I actually do want to compile a lot of these interviews into a book at some stage. Um, Brilliant. But but I want to rewind a bit. And I know you you had like, based on emails that we've exchanged before, you had a killer job. You said you were like a war crimes prosecutor, which I think is so badass. I um, was. Yeah, no, that's, that's the thing. I thought I had my dream job. Yeah, like working for the UN, like a good salary. So what was it that, that wasn't fulfilling for you? I think it was my priorities were wrong when I took that job. I took it because of the status um, that I thought I'd get from it. I thought it was really cool to tell people that I worked as a war crimes lawyer. But then when I looked at my day-to-day life, my actual work, I thought it's not actually that fulfilling. I'm doing really basic, tedious work, and I couldn't actually see any purpose to my work. I thought anyone could do this. I'm not doing anything special. I'm not doing anything unique or um I just and I sort of became disillusioned with the notion of justice, and yeah, I just realized I had picked my career based on the wrong things on wanting the status, and also i I did largely become a lawyer to try and make my parents proud, and sort of it was a realization that those weren't and shouldn't be my career priorities, you know status isn't what it's <laughs> all hyped mm. up to be, yeah, I'm sure that's something that you picked up a lot in the interviews is like doing something because it was. A, a good job on paper or it would make people impressed um, absolutely and i i really resonated with how in your story to me as well you mentioned you know you would leave work as soon as possible um when i was still in my corporate job i would kind of count down the hours till i could go home and as soon as time hit i would be out of that place um, yeah cool so uh i know at some stage you quit and became a ski technician i think your sister was That's working right. yeah your sister was working like in a in a fun job um but i'd love to hear your advice um for people who are thinking of quitting their job to do what what people would call a fun job um like the you know the teaching or the ski slopes or that kind of thing cuz i actually was very close to doing this myself um just last year of quitting and going to teach english in south korea Um, Mm. but I'd love to hear your opinion or your advice for people thinking of doing that. Yeah, sure. Well, I've got a a section in the book called sabbaticals because I I differentiate between two types of sabbaticals that you can take from your career. One is a radical sabbatical and one is a me sabbatical. So a radical sabbatical is when you take some time off to do something crazy and different. So that could be, for example, in my book, one of the guys cycled a bike from the UK to China. Or it could be moving to a ski resort and working a season as a ski technician. And then the other one is a me sabbatical where you just take some time out to get to know yourself, you know, go on a retreat or just indulge yourself in all the activities you've wanted to do, do a, you know, an art course or just something that allows you to clear your head a bit. So with the radical sabbatical, I guess as long as you know what the goal of it is, then you don't, there's not this sort of worry of getting lost. Mm-hmm. If you go in there sort of on a ski season and you know it's a season, you know there's an end date and you know that what you want to do on that ski season is have some fun, get to know yourself a little better and then approach the post-ski job life afterwards with a clearer mind, then that's sort of the way to go in there. Just, so, yeah, my advice would be have a goal. Know that it's going to end and know that you need to learn the certain things you want to learn during that period of time because then it's not a holiday. People yeah. might say, oh, they've quit their job to just bum around. You say, no, I was teaching myself, learn, learning myself stuff, picking up some new skills. There is an end goal. I mean, there is an end and there is a goal to it. So it's just life lessons. Yeah, I think a lot of people go into those kind of things as a as a way to run away from their problems. Um, and I've heard like stories of friends of friends who have gone and then done it for like 10 years and just never wanted to leave. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which I'm sure you uncovered too. And then I, I also wanted to ask, based on your experience um, of, you know, you mentioned how you just quit kind of cold turkey and just wholeheartedly. Looking back, what is your kind of thoughts um, about doing that versus, you know, starting something on the side or slowly transitioning into a new job? Yeah, again, there's sort of two chapters I've, I've dealt with in my book. And one is called Side Projects and one is called Chop and Change. 
side projects deals with the people who are too scared to just quit cold turkey. And it gives different examples of how people manage side projects. Um, I personally couldn't do that because I don't have the attention span capable. Um, I'm not very good at multitasking. So for me, it's all or nothing. So I realized that I was going to have to quit my job outright and walk away because I was in such a bad headspace from it. I couldn't, if I looked at other jobs, if I went on job websites, everything looked bleak. My whole, the whole world looked bleak to me. And I realized I need to get myself happy again, positive again, so that when I read these, I can see potential rather than just doom and gloom. Mm. So I think if people are good at multitasking and they like having a lot on their plate, they're open to experimentation, then perhaps a side project is a good way to start. But if they're in such a bad mind frame that their side project's got no hope of really taking off, then perhaps they do just have to quit outright. And it's it's terrifying, but um, there's a an academic called Herminia Ibarra who I can't remember the name of her book. I'm sorry. I'll try and remember it. <laughs> um, but it's she's an academic and she looks into changing careers and she firmly says you have to act. You can't think. If you think about it, A, you'll get it wrong. B, you probably won't stop thinking about it. You'll end up in analysis paralysis. You have to just make a move and it, often that involves just quitting or just applying for a new job and jumping into it. Yeah, and there's people listening thinking like, yeah, but if you if you don't think and you just act, then you might get it wrong too. But the thing is like then you've acted and you're closer to coming up with a, a solution. Whereas if yeah. you think and think and think, you might still get it wrong anyway. You haven't actually gone anywhere yet. Yeah, and if you're just thinking you haven't crossed anything off your options list, but if you act and it doesn't work out, at least you can say, okay, well, I tried another job, didn't work out. That's mm -hmm. one less on my list. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, you spoke about like being terrified and that kind of thing. And I, I just want to kind of dive into Kate's mind of when that moment you realized you actually don't want to be a lawyer because you, you went back home then, um, and landed another job after being out of work for a while. But you said you kind of slipped back into that same realization of like, this is really not fulfilling. Um, talk yeah. us through what was going through your mind through that realization. It was, it was very slow. Um, I honestly, it took me a really long time to realize that the source of my unhappiness was my job. I thought it was because I had moved countries. Um, I thought, because, you know, I was, I was living in Cape Town and I love Cape Town. Mm -hmm. I, I did my master's there. And then I had to move back to Australia, back to my hometown. And I thought, oh, that's what's making me miserable. It's that I had to change my life again. But then when I realized, you know, my outside life was quite fine, I realized, no, it's, it's the fact that you were spending eight hours a day doing a job you're not particularly interested in. And um, the hardest thing to admit was to myself. But then the second hardest thing was to tell my parents because they were so proud of telling everyone about me and my job. Well, that's what I thought they were proud of. Turns out, you know, they were proud of me as a person rather than my job title. <laughs> what? <laughs> So basically, after I read this book by Rome Kuznarik, I had confirmed the decision, and that was that I had to leave the law. And um, yeah, at that point, I didn't really know much else what I wanted to do, but I thought if I start compiling people's stories and start doing research for this book, although it's not going to pay any bills, and it's going to mean I'm probably going to go into debt whilst I you know, don't have a regular paycheck, at least it means I'm taking steps to figure out what's next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I love how you paired it with creating something out of it. It wasn't just you trying to find answers, but you know, the book kind of came came along for the for the ride. And I do want to shift gears and and speak about the book a bit. Um, I think right in the beginning of the book, you speak about um, you know, there's a free excerpt on the website which I'll link to in the show notes. But you speak about why are we having a quarter life crisis? And I wonder yeah. if you could share a bit about those findings with us. Yeah, absolutely. So I felt a little bit miffed that a lot of the time when I told people I was unhappy in my job, particularly older generations sort of laughed at me and told me I was being a whinging millennial. Mm -hmm. And I did. I've, for a while, I was a little bit embarrassed. I thought I am being pathetic. I mean, I've got this on paper amazing career. I've got a good paycheck. I live in a peaceful, lovely city. What am I complaining about? But then I was still going home miserable every day and I thought there's got to be a reason why I'm feeling like this and why it's so prevalent amongst our generation. So I did some research and I, I wanted to know what was special or unique about Generation Y. 
And there's a lot of things that make us different to our parents and make us more susceptible to having a quarter life crisis. One of the first things I looked at was the global financial crisis, because that happened in 2008 when a lot of Gen Yers were just coming out of university and they're in their early careers. Mm -hmm. Um, Global financial crisis happened and suddenly all the jobs are gone. We've all just paid large amounts of money to go to university or do our traineeship and suddenly there's no jobs. So we're sitting with student debt and there are no jobs available and then we're told we have to do unpaid internships. So, yes, we're a little bit disillusioned and disgruntled at this point. Then there's the housing crisis. Now, our parents all bought houses back when they were cheap and when they were sort of proportionate to their salary, whereas now it's so out of reach for us. Again, we sort of, we've got this situation where we don't have a job, we've got student debt, we can't afford a house, so we're not in a great frame of mind. Comes Social media comes in. Everyone's posting filtered social media just talking about their achievements, about um, you know, showing filtered photos and talking about their job promotions, not telling everyone about the bad parts of their life. So we've got this distorted view of how everyone's living. So we think our lives aren't as good as everybody else. We've got student debt. We don't have a job. Everyone else has got a better life than us. Of course, we're prone to having breakdowns and questioning ourselves. So that was sort of my research, and it, was, it, it made me feel better about having it. Because then I didn't think, no, I'm not being petty. I'm not being silly. If I don't want to be a lawyer, I can find something else. I'm not going to be miserable eight hours a day. Mm-hmm. And it's not just me being yeah, petty about it. It's just, you know, the world has set me up for this. And uh, yeah, yeah so I, 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 I felt more comfortable about it after that. I, I often laugh at the, the argument that like, you know, it's just the millennial generation that are uh, entitled and that kind of thing and like not willing to work hard. Actually, I think it's quite the opposite. It's just that millennials want to walk, work hard towards something meaningful. Um, yeah. And the social media one's a big one. Um, but ironically, I think social media is such a gift in terms of like it's created work for so many people um, mm. and not just like working as a social media manager but you know being able to make a living from from your talents and putting it out there and finding a tribe of people who really resonate with what you're doing i think if if social media didn't exist i'm not quite sure um how some of those things would would be possible um oh, definitely it's created lots of opportunities totally and i love how with the book you you said you know you don't want it to be a self help book But you want it to be kind of an encyclopedia of options of like, hey, here's how these people have done things and you can kind of adapt those to your own situation. Um, And I want to get into, you know, some of the interesting stories and and strategies that people have used to navigate the quarter life crises that you spoke about in the book. John? Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's say maybe like your, your, like maybe three stories that really stick out to you. Okay. Um, well, probably the one that sticks out to most people just because it's quite an extreme option was uh, one girl that I met in South Africa was really, really struggling to find her identity. So she wound up going on a three-month ayahuasca retreat in Peru. And um, so she ended up taking these hallucinogenic drugs 12 times a month for three months. And what I find interesting about her story is that despite doing all that and sort of tapping into these different parts of her brain, she told me that she finds more fulfillment, more answers from a life coach that she visits once a week. And I just thought that was incredible because she went to such an extreme measure to tap into a side of her. Um, But then it was just having a conversation with a person who asked the right questions Mm -hmm. that actually helped her find more, more direction. Mm -hmm. So hers was, hers was amusing. I found it entertaining (laughs) because it was so extreme Yet such a simple solution was so, so much more relevant and helpful for her. 12 times a month for three months. Yeah. And so the the chapter describes pretty in depth what she went through, the feelings, the experience. So, I mean, it's something that most people won't, a lot of people, I didn't even know about ayahuasca until I interviewed her. Um, so I think it's just sort of an interesting story for people yeah. to see a really extreme method, but <laughs> I, I said, I don't, I don't condone it. I, I just like the fact that the life coach ended up being more fulfilling for her. Yeah. I, I've heard of ayahuasca before, but I never realized, you know, I thought it was something you did once and that was it. I didn't realize it was like a prolonged, um, 
series of um, yeah no it can be (laughs) all right so what are some of the others that you unraveled or discovered another one I quite enjoyed but I was also quite anxious about writing about was my friend Courtney um Courtney opened a business which failed and so I was anxious about writing about her and you know shutting down of her business because I thought it's just an uncomfortable topic a lot of money was spent you know she a lot of her pride was tied up with that business but interviewing her was one of the funnest interviews I did because she was laughing you know in a way that wasn't you know sort of hysterical oh no I really stuffed up laughing she was saying I learned so much um what I spent my money on was basically a university of life and she quite rightly pointed out that the amount of money she spent on a business and the amount of years she spent running the business was actually more than I had spent on my degree wasn't it was more experience she gained than I got in my degree and she spent less money than I paid on my degree so I thought that's a really nice way to put it she made a loss but she had educated herself she had started a business she had learned from the mistakes she made and she still quite proudly calls herself a business owner and knows what to do in the future so I quite enjoyed doing Courtney's story because it sort of shows that it doesn't always end in the most positive way but as long as you take lessons from it then it's worth it. And apart from the, you know, the awesome stories that you collected, I think you interviewed like over 70 people. What were some of the sort of unexpected findings that you gathered while doing not just the interviews, but even your own research? I think I sort of unexpectedly, I won't say cured myself, but helped myself for the next time I had another crisis. Um, when I finished the book, I had another little hiccup in my career. Because at that point, I had found a new career and I was working in it. And I thought, oh, good, you know, I've, I've figured myself out. And then the same thing happened to what happened when I was practicing a lawyer. Just after a couple of weeks of not feeling so good, I finally realized, oh, no, I've, I'm in the wrong career again. And rather than panicking like I did the first time and thinking, oh, God, what have I done? Have I you know, wasted years studying again? Um, and what am I going to do next? I was completely calm. And I honestly applied the stories that people had told me to my situation. I took their advice. Um, and it wasn't just one person's story that I applied because no one story completely applies to your situation. So I implied, uh, applied bits and bobs from other people's stories. And I couldn't believe how quicker, how much quicker I went through this process. Suddenly I had options. Um, and, you know, I ended up in a new job two weeks later as opposed to four months, which took me last time. And I was just really, I was really impressed with sort of my state of mind. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't have done that without other people's stories, without the advice they gave me. And I've written that at the end of the book. I've explained how, whose stories I applied and how it helped me. And I'll be forever grateful for those people for giving me those tips. Yeah, it's amazing. And it, it's kind of like, you know, that's what the book is intended to do for people who read it is give them this buffet of options um, and they can then use them for their own situation. Um, yeah. That's really cool. And another thing that I, I was just smiling here as I was listening to you speaking, how you mentioned your friend Courtney had, you know, she would spent more money and, and failed and started her own business and learned um, all these lessons. But essentially, you've done the same thing instead of, you know, you could have just been depressed and got another job or, or not got another job. But instead, you made a decision to go out and, and speak to people who'd gone through this kind of thing. And so yeah. you, you essentially gave yourself an education in that, um, which is really Yeah, I think cool. giving some people work quite well with projects. Mm-hmm. Um, I know my brother's the same. If he needs to get something done, he has to turn it into a project so that he can sort of see it in totality. And I've, I've had the same with the book. So rather than saying, okay, I'm just going to read about it, I thought, no, I need to make a project out of this so that I actually do it. Yeah, and they say like the best way to learn something is to teach it to other people. So yeah, very true. There you go. <laughs> uh, Kate, before we wrap up here, is there anything we haven't mentioned that you think might be valuable for people listening? Uh, just at the back of the book, I've also compiled a list of all the suggested readings, podcasts, websites that everyone gave to me. So it's not my compiled list. I've got my, I've put my stuff in there as well. But every time I interviewed someone, they always had a podcast or a book or something that helped them. So I put that in the back of the book. So. Even if people don't want to read the book, if they just want a list of resources, it's in there as well. And I think, yeah, there's a lot in there that could potentially help people. That's really cool. That's really cool. 
Cool, Kate. Uh, I do have some final questions at the end here. So just the first thing that comes to your mind is is perfect. The first one is, what do you wish you'd been told early in your 20s? That you have a whole decade at least ahead of you to experiment. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest opportunity for quarter lifers today? To experiment. Other <laughs> generations didn't get it. I mean, our, our parents, and um, I've got some stats in there about the age that people had children at and got married at and from the 1970s to now we've got an extra 10 years child for a year so it's you know you're allowed to experiment <laughs> that's what it's there for perfect uh before i get to the final question where can people go to find out more about you and the book and everything else you've got going on so the book is available on amazon um but i've also got a website which is notmyjam.org and on the website there is an excerpt from the book and there's also a link to the Amazon page. I need to up my interviewing game. I think we've gotten the whole interview without me even asking for the name of the book. But it is <laughs> <laughs> it is not my jam, which I love. And I'll link up to that in the show notes. Uh, Kate, before I get to the final question, I just want to take a second to acknowledge you for coming on today and, and sharing your story and, you know, turning your, your struggle and um, your kind of unfulfillment in your job to really a project and helping other people in the same time and documenting things that other people had done to help them. And, um, you know, also on a, on a kind of more micro level, I know you had offers to turn this book into something different to what you'd imagined and what you wanted, and you kind of stuck your ground and, and kept it true to what you'd imagined. So I want to acknowledge you for that too. Um, the, oh, thank you. the final question that I do have is what one thing can listeners do this week to start creating their own quarter life comeback? Talk to people, network, reach out, ask for a coffee, have as many conversations as you can. I love it. Because you sometimes think, oh, there's no point. They've got nothing to do with my career, but down the track, they might have the connection. You can put you in touch with someone and something always comes from it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Kate Dodge. And thank you so much for coming on the quarter life comeback. No worries. Thanks for having me. So there you have it, guys and girls. That wraps up episode 76 of the Quarter Life Comeback podcast. And uh, thanks once again to Kate Dodgson for coming on and sharing a bit of her research into the Quarter Life crisis and her own story too. If you enjoyed this one, please share it around with your friends on social media and shoot me a tweet at Brian Tier to let me know your biggest takeaway. For me, it was the fact that, you know, the story Kate shared of the girl doing ayahuasca for three months, like three times a week, and then having a more impactful experience working with a coach and just having someone asking her the right questions. And on that front, I just wanted to mention that, you know, I've never really spoken about it on the show, but if you're listening to this and you haven't really um, been over to my website or checked out some of the other things I do, um, I do work as a coach and you know that's that's kind of the, the work that I do aside from this podcast. And so if you're looking for someone to ask you the right questions or get a different view on things and kind of challenge the way you've been seeing things, then reach out to me and let's schedule a call and see how I can help. Now, as always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in this episode at bryantier.com slash 076. And make sure you head on over to quarterlifecomeback.com to get all these episodes and more as soon as they go live. Thanks once again for joining me this week. And until next time, keep creating your quarter life comeback. Thanks for listening to the Quarter Life Comeback. Get started today by visiting bryantier.com.